Welcome back my guinea pigs. Uh, today we will deep dive into floppy disks. So as usual, hang on to your training wheels and let's deep dive. Before talking about floppy disks, let's talk about just standard magnetic recording media. So even like when you look at movies right in the 50s or 60s, they are using tapes, right? So even even in family computers from the 80s, uh, we were using tapes. And it's the same concept. You have some kind of surface made of iron oxide and you use a recording head that is more or less a very small electromagnet. When you apply some current on this small electromagnet, it creates a magnetic field that changes the magnetic orientation of the medium and records this orientation on it. And then by moving the tape, you can record information by flipping this orientation along the way. Let's go back to our subject, the floppy disks. So floppy disks are just the same kind of medium, except that it is a disk, right? Uh, usually they are Millar disks, and the floppy side of it and it records the information in a circular fashion. One of those circles is called a track. Um, floppy disks have a, a mechanism to actually detect uh, when the head is on track zero and from that fixed point can activate a step motor to step and jump from one track to another. Then those tracks are divided into sectors. You can see them there. For example, here we have 11 tracks. But it doesn't mean that they are in this order. Uh, track 1 could be the first, second could be the third, uh, third could be the sixth, and so on. Uh, that's an optimization so that you don't have to wait for another turnaround to actually find your next track. Let's go back to our recording head. Now you understand that this tape could be represented as a kind of a circular track around the floppy disk. Now, if we try to encode data in it, so imagine like we, we have those uh, south, north, south, north orientations, right? The head can only detect when this orientation changes. Because when it changes, it creates a little current when you try to read it back from the, the head. So here with the little arrows, you, you can spot where those orientations are changing. So basically it creates flux in the head. If you clean up the signal, it could, could look like that. So you are about to tell me, easy, right? Like when it's down, it's zero, when it's up, it's one. But wait a second. We are talking about a floppy disk where you have a motor that is turning the floppy at a not very stable speed. And uh, like I was telling you before, if the value doesn't change, you have no information. You don't know that you, you went from one little sector to another, right? So basically those four zeros, for example, in a row, depending on the speed of the of the wombliness and so on of the, of the mechanism. Is it four zeros, three zeros, or five zeros? You don't know actually. Um, and that's a problem. So how do we fix this? Here you see that the issue is having always zeros or ones in a row. So let's go to this first one. Let's represent one as a one and zero and a zero as a one, or vice versa. Actually, if they are back to back, they are flipping, fli flipping upside down. It is called FM encoding, like frequency modulation encoding, and this is the encoding that is used in single density floppy disks. So let's look at this little encoded uh, signal: one one zero zero one. When you look at the distance between the when the signal is going up and going down, you can have only two lengths. 
one short one and one long one. If you know how to play music, it's really that you have two kind of notes, a short one and a long one. Of course, the efficiency of this encoding is 1.5 transition per bit, right? Either it's two or one. So if you have the same probability of having zero or one, then it's 1.5 as a mean. So why are we talking about like rhythm with notes? Because we are, we are using a device called a PLL. A PLL is, uh, we won't go into too much detail, detail on this, it's just a device that can actually catch up on, on the rhythm when, you, when it gets a signal. So out of this signal that has two type of rhythms, it gets the smaller one that actually accommodates both. So that creates a clock signal that's how this encoding can just, because the way it is represented on disk, can, can create from itself the clock that is used to decode it. Think about it when you are listening to music, right? When you are li listening to some drum beats. Drum beats are not completely equal, right? But you can still, as a human, count one, two, three, one, two, three. This is exactly the same concept. And we can do even better. It's called MFM, Modified Frequency Modulation. So, ones are encoded with kind of zero, then one. Zeros are one, then zeros, if they are after a zero. And zeros, only two zeros, if they are after a one. So if you want to represent our little example, the one zero 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 one, the one will be encoded low and high. Um, then it is a zero after a one, so it's going to be low, low. Then it's a zero after a zero, so it's going to be low, high. Then high, low, and finally low, high for the next one. So here, instead of encoding the information over two rhythms, we encoded it over three rhythms. It could be a transition of one bit, two bits, or three bits. So the mean of that is 0 0.75 transition per bit, which is pretty good. And because it doubles the density of the single density floppy disk, it is called double densities. That's also the ones you, we are using on the Amiga, for example. Let's open back one of those SCP image files we got from the previous episode. If you really, really zoom in, you will start to see those zero and ones as they are encoded on the disk. The green parts means that it is the beginning of a sector. So let's check that out. Let's pop back our little encoding room and let's get cranking. So we start with one zero. Okay, that's zero. Then one zero, again a zero. One zero, again a zero. Okay, we start to understand that. Then we have a zero one, which is one, then a zero, then a one, and so on and so on. If you look now at how sectors are encoded on the Amiga. Before the sector, there are couples of zeros. Those are the ones we, we spotted. And then the markers for the beginning of the sector is A1. Bingo, we got it. Now, when you zoom out, you'll notice that we have those on the y-axis, those length in time. Those are the rhythms I was talking about. 
And there you see that there are three of them. Like I was saying, the MFM encoding is encoded with three different lengths between bits. So once a sector has been recognized, it contains all the metadata it, the floppy disk or the controller needs to get to not only confirm on which track it is, but also which sector is coming in in front of the head. And that's what you see with this picture. You see at every single fringe between those sectors, there is this metadata that is actually telling the system which track is following up. Here we explored the floppies coming from an Amiga, but they are varying in size and shape and how they are encoded and, and for example, how sectors are recognized. Um, some of those are actually hard sectored. For example, you have actually a physical mark on the disk for the floppy disk reader to spot them. And some of them have viable length sectors, depending on if they are inside the disk or outside of the disk. The 8-bit guide made an awesome video about that. Uh, and this is almost like a deep dive on top of it. So I hope you enjoy this video. Feel free to uh, ping me or contact me if you want me to explore uh, a subject like this in depth. If you like the video, please uh, give me a, a thumbs up. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you want to follow on my next uh, video. And take care.